everyone. We are here. We are ready to go. New Hope Radio. Coming your way over 1590 WARV. TV. Click Facebook. And streaming at WARV.net. Three different ways you can get the program. Here on Facebook, Aaron is, he just checked in. He is ready to meet you and greet you. And if you're on Facebook, let us know where you're, where you're, where you're tuning in from. We want to know. I know we got a lot of folks, a lot of friends in Florida that listen to New Hope Radio and our prayers go out to them. Hopefully you're doing well and uh, making a good recovery out there. So thank you for joining us today. We are continuing in our series. I like this series. You know what it's called? My Journey. And it's about our journey through life. You know, every journey has a beginning and it has a goal, a destination. And what's in between the beginning and the destination, that's your journey. We're all born, hopefully we're journeying toward redemption. At the end of your life, you will find God. That you will be redeemed and you will have the assurance of heaven. So this whole series is about, okay, what happens in between the beginning and the end of my journey? Okay, today we come to an aspect of the journey. Really, it's an aspect of understanding the Bible in a way in which it was meant to be understood. I think we get a lot of folks today, they misunderstand the purpose of the Bible, and that's why they get things wrong. And then there's others, because of that, they don't even bother with it. There is a specific purpose for the gift of the Bible that God has given us. Uh, in the Old Testament days, people used what's called the Torah. The Torah, the root word means to shoot an arrow, to hit the target. And it's simply teaching which guides and instructs. For us today, we have more than the Torah. We have the whole canon of Scripture, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I'm going to tell you something. It is a gift from God. And it's a book of instruction. And I, I wonder how many people really see the Bible as a book of instruction. Because that's what it is. It's instruction for life. You want to have a good life, you want to have a better understanding of life, then you've got to read the Bible. That's what you have to do. Because it's God's instruction book for life. Okay? Now, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, that you were called to freedom, brethren. That's good news, right? You like that? You were called to freedom. Only, do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. What does that mean? Selfishness. Living for you. Want to have a bad life? Live for you. And your life will stink, I'll tell you right now. But he said, through love, serve one another. Oh, God is telling us how to have a pretty good life. Through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You know what we're going to talk about today? Love. We're going to talk about love. And how important love is for your life's journey. Okay? I mean, when Jesus was on the earth, they had the Torah. And he kind of broke it down into understanding the Torah, into one word, love. Paul took it in the New Testament. He said, yeah, man, it's the same thing for us. Love. Here, here it is. The message of of the Bible is love, right? Now, the Torah is the five books of Moses. And uh, in the strictest sense, it's those first five books. But the whole of Scripture is very, very broad. And you know what happens? In the five books of Moses, think of it, there are 613 commandments in the whole first five books of the Old Testament. 248 are positive. In other words, they say, do this, 365 are negative, they say, don't do that, okay, 
So we're going to boil it down to the simplest form today. Okay? What is the simplest form of all of these commandments that God has given us in His Word? Because we like to keep it simple. And you know, when Jesus comes on the earth, came on the earth, He kept it simple too. And through James, God said, You are fulfilling the royal law according to the Scripture when you love your neighbor as yourself. James is saying what Paul said, Paul is saying what Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. You can't overlook that, can you? You can't overlook it. And you know why Jesus brought it up? Why he simplified it? Because one day in Matthew 22, somebody came to him. And he said, oh teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? In other words, Jesus, how do you read the Torah? What is its summarizing principle? Okay? So Jesus is going to boil it down to the simplest principles that there are. And he basically said, listen, this is it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then he said, let me add one more to it. The great and foremost commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's like, if you took the whole 613 of those commandments and you boiled it down to two, that's what you would have. Here's what you would have. Love God and love people. You know what, folks? That's Christianity. There's a lot of, I believe, misrepresentation of Christianity today. Because people are not loving God, and they're not loving people. So, when you see those not loving God and not loving people, that's not Christianity. Say, no, 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 man, that's not what God called us to. He called us to love Him and love each other. And why? See, we have to love God first. You know why? Because it's hard to love each other. You know why? Because we bug each other, don't we? People bother each other. People don't know how to drive. <laughs> People say dumb things. It's hard to love everybody. But here's the key. When you love God, God's love is in you. And God's love comes through you. Even toward people who can't drive. Even toward people who say dumb things. You can actually, with the love of God, love the unlovely. Because that's what God's love did for us, didn't it? Man, we were like unlovely when Jesus died for us. We were, the Bible says we were, we were enemies, we were sinners, and yet Christ died for us. That's, the, that's God's love. And when God's love is in you, you can love those that you might consider to be unlovely. Okay? So, hey, there it is. Love God and love your neighbor. Or love God and love each other. Okay? You know, you know what the Apostle John would say? He said, you cannot love God and hate your neighbor. He said, if you say you love God and you hate your neighbor, you're lying. That's like, whoa, what do you mean? Yeah, you're lying. You cannot love God unless loving your neighbor is included. That's like, wow. Wow. I guess we just put all those extremists in their place, didn't we? We just put terrorism in its place, didn't we? Because if you ain't loving people, you ain't loving God. That's what I should have called this message. You ain't loving people, you ain't loving God. You can't love God without loving people. See what God does? Oh, I like this. He makes it practical. It's very practical. Christianity isn't like walking around with your head in the clouds. No, Christianity is fleshed out in your life. You live it out daily here on planet Earth. So, Jesus could say, 
when you do something kind, right? When you do a kind thing to people, then you are doing something kind to God. Because God, God takes how people are treated personally. He really does. He takes it personally. Jesus said, when you, when you do something good to the least of these, my brethren, you do it unto me. When Saul of Tarsus was persecuting the church, Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. You know what he said to him? He said, Saul, man, why are you persecuting me? Saul's like, no, I'm not persecuting you, God. I'm persecuting people. No, those people belong to me. When you persecute them, you persecute me. Wow, what a wake-up call Saul of Tarsus got. Jesus said, if you're asking your Heavenly Father to forgive you, what must you do first? Forgive others. Oh, wow. God does keep it personal, doesn't he? He keeps it practical. You want God to forgive you? Are you forgiving people? Are you forgiving those that have wronged you? That have hurt you? When I love my neighbor, who's made in the image of God, I'm showing my love to God. And you know the opposite is true. If I'm not loving my neighbor, who's made in the image of God, then I'm not loving God. See, I think more people would gravitate toward Christianity if they saw it lived out the right way. I mean, I know there's wackos in everything, right? There's wackos all over the internet. There's wackos all over the fa Facebook. There's wackos all over the news. Oh yeah, man, they're not newsmen anymore. They're just like wacky people saying wacky things. But even in Christianity, we have a misrepresentation of who God is and of what the Christian life is. we got to get it right. you got to get it right. you got to get God's love in you first. Then when you get God's love in you, you can show God's love to others. And people that can't show God's love to others is because they don't have God's love in them. And I don't care if you call yourself a Christian or non-Christian. It doesn't matter what you call yourself. It doesn't even matter if you go to church. The question is God's love in you. And are you showing that very same love to other people? That's the question. That's what makes it real. And if more of God's people could live in that, more people would be coming to churches. More people would be looking for Christ. And wanting, I believe, God in their lives. So think about it. Think about how simple Christianity can be. We can do it, and Jesus simplified it for us. You know, people talk about a vertical relationship with God, and that's important. What's a vertical relationship with God? It's you and God, one-on-one. -on -one. Mano a mano. Right? You're with God, God's with you. That's half of it. The other half is a horizontal relationship, which means how you interact, uh-oh, with people. That's the other. See, now we've got the cross. The vertical relationship with God, the horizontal relationship with people, that's the cross. That's the full package of Christianity. We cannot just go higher we have to go wider. you got to spread your wings and fly. you got to be around other people. Jesus said in John chapter 13, He said, okay, everybody, listen up. A new commandment I give to you. And here it is. That you love one another even as I have loved you. Oh, why is this a new commandment? Because in the Old Testament, people only had to love others so far. And then after that, they could stop. But Jesus is saying, I got something new. I want you to love the way I love you. How does Jesus love us? Like man, unconditionally. Non-stop. Without limits. That's how. He's taking you to a life without limits. That's the Christian life. If you can love people without limits, that's Christianity. You're doing it. You're doing it. 
You're doing a great job. That's what it's about. You know why we have the Word of God? To teach us to love. Paul said, the goal of our instruction, it's not knowledge. It's not winning a debate or an argument. The goal of our instruction, here it comes, is love. That's the goal. Why do we learn the Bible? Why do we go to church every week and learn the Word of God? Because we're learning how to love. This kind of love, this supernatural love, yeah, it's unnatural. It's not natural. It's something that's derived from God. And we can only find out about it through His Word. So the new commandment Jesus gives, Love others as I have loved you. So should you love one another. And then he capped it off and he said, Oh man, here comes the cherry on top. By this, when you love others the way I loved you, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Oh, that's how you tell a true Christian. You don't tell a true Christian by those who come early to church or those who stay late. You can't even tell a true Christian by those who read their Bibles, because there are some pretty sour puss Christians that read their Bibles. <clears throat> but they're like sour. <clears throat> sour. They're like, they're like uh, sweet tots. You ever have sweet tots? My mouth is watering just thinking about it. They're like sour. You know, I remember when we were kids, we had penny candies. We would buy sour balls. Remember sour balls? You'd be like, it's hard candy. You put it in your mouth and you're like, Ugh. it's like it's like eating a sour egg. It's like, Ugh. it was sour. Made your face cave in. There are Christians that know the Bible very well, but they haven't reached the goal. They haven't come to love. They stopped that instruction. They didn't make the leap to love. See, Jesus said, this is something that mocks you out as people that belong to me. Oh, people that belong to God. People that belong to God are recognized by the love that they have for others. Wow. So now we're instructed, love your neighbors, not as you used to, but as Jesus has shown you. Yeah, and he gave, a, he gave a lot of examples. You know the story of the Good Samaritan. And the whole point of the story is, wait a minute, that the guy that was left beaten and half dead, and they robbed him, we believe he was Jewish, and the guy that came along and rescued him and healed him and took care of him, he was a Samaritan, and the Jews and Samaritans didn't like each other, and yet this guy was a Samaritan and he demonstrated love toward a nationality that despised him. But because of who he was, he was able to help someone that didn't like him. See, that's, Jesus is saying, that's love. That's love. Remember, God expresses his own character in his word and his character is love god is love boom right god is love god so loved us that he sent his only because his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will never perish but have everlasting life love what god does is out of love if god didn't have love would he be god hmm. he'd be a god but if he didn't have love, man, we'd all be in trouble. Oh, would we be in trouble. I'm so thankful God is a God of love. In 1 John chapter 3, John said, This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. Oh, just as he commanded us. Oh, now it's not optional. Now God's not saying, listen, if you're in a good mood and you feel like loving people, go ahead. He's saying, no, you better do this. I expect you 
to do this. I expect you to love people. That if you love me, you better love people. And if you don't love people, that's only because you don't really love me. You love you. You love you. And you do what you want. See, when you love God, you do what God wants. When you love you, you do what you want. <laughs> what you want. What you want. <laughs> what you want. Okay. Right. And then he said, the one who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. So, if you keep the commandment of loving people, it shows you that you're in God and God's in you. That's a good deal. And we know by this that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he's given us. So, again, you see, love is a real telltale sign of where you are in your Christian life. How do I walk with Christ? How do I abide in Christ? By keeping his commandments. That's how. And what's the commandment? The commandment is to love. To love who? To love people. Well, how do I love them? Love them the way Jesus loves me. That's how. Now, we just said if we keep his commandments, we abide in him, right? Now, if we love one another, he abides in us. And his love is perfected in us. Perfected means brought to completion. It has reached, oh, this is so good, it has reached the intended goal. You know what's frustrating? When you get on a plane and it's diverted and it doesn't bring you to your destination. Or you get on a boat and it can't go to the port you want it to go to. It had to go somewhere else. Isn't that frustrating? It's like, yeah. Well, you know what's worse? When God's love doesn't reach its intended goal, being coming through you to other people. That's frustrating to God. That's like, no, man. The, when God's love is perfected in you, it reaches its intended goal. The intended goal is others. We become the vessels of God's love. It comes to us, and then it goes through us. That's all we are. You're like a straw. And God puts his love in you, and it goes through you. And like a straw, right? People draw the love of God out of you. When we were kids, we used to, we had these straws, and they had little chocolate powder in the straw. I don't think they make them anymore. Too bad. And you put the straw in milk, and you, when you draw on the straw, the milk comes through the chocolate powder, and you get in your mouth chocolate milk. <laughs> that was awesome when we were kids. Well, you're the straw, and God's got his love in you. And people are going to draw from you. And you know what they're going to get? The love of God. Oh. And, and you become a sweet fragrance to them. That's how the love of God is perfected. It's perfected in your acts of love. So the love of God comes to its completion. It comes to its fulfillment in your acts of love toward others. That's why God put his love in in you. So you can be the vessel by which it goes out towards others. And I'm going to tell you what, it's a lot of fun. It's an enjoyable thing to show the love of God. You should try it. You got to practice. It's not easy. You got to practice. And the more you practice something, the better you get at it. So the more you practice loving people, the more you practice loving the stranger and loving the unlovely, the better you'll get at it, and the more you're going to enjoy it. Practice it. Practice being that nice person, that loving person, and get really good at it. And like John said, if you say you love God, but you're not doing these things, you're not, you're not truthful. You're not telling the truth. He said it. The one who says he abides in him, or to walk in the same manner as he walked. Okay? If I abide in Christ, I need to walk like Christ. 
Hmm. If Christ is in me, I need to reveal that Christ is in me. And people will draw out of me the love of Christ. So, it's an amazing thing, isn't it? It's an incredible thing. Sometimes the, uh, the crises, the natural catastrophes that we find ourselves in, give us opportunities to show God's love. You know, when there are natural disasters, it's easy sometimes to come alongside your fellow man and show God's love. But then after the disaster, uh, we forget. We go back to the old ways. Don't forget. If things are good right now in your life, start showing the love of God more than ever before. you got to get it from God you get it from God, and then it'll go through you, and people will draw it out of you to them. To, I don't know, to me, that's what makes the Christian life so appealing. That's the beauty of Christianity. Christianity should be a beautiful, it's not a religion, but we'll call it a religion. It's a beautiful religion. It's appealing, because it's very, very helpful. Most religions, all religions, are not beautiful. They're not. Christianity is beautiful. You know why? Because it's the way that God is revealed. But we have to do it. And we have to do it right. Okay? Everything God does is perfect. And it's our responsibility to manifest that perfection in our lives. Okay? Hey, thank you for coming along, everybody. Facebook, YouTube, WARV. By the way, these teachings will be stored on YouTube, and you can go there and you can watch them anytime. Hit like, hit share, let people know what God's love is like, and we'll, we'll be back tomorrow for more of New Hope Radio. Have a great day.